I will declare this open and I will call to order. Let's talk to the people of America for a silent prayer and reflection. Amen. And now the roll call. Here. 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 I've always put it to the end. Next thing we have up is uh, Ms. Festa. This is the second public hearing to announce that LHUSD will be using an instructional time model for K-6 students who wish to remain in an online setting through the end of first semester. Any school district or charter school wishing to offer remote learning must do, through, do so through an adopted ITM or through an AOI pursuant to ARS 15808. House Bill 2862 allows school districts and charter schools to adopt an ITM to meet the instructional hour requirements in the ARS 15808 and 15901, which provides flexibility for a school district or charter district to determine the manner in which instructional hours are provided to students. LHUSD will adopt an instructional time model for students in kindergarten through sixth grade who wish to continue their coursework in the school's PLP platform. Students may only spend the equivalent of a semester in school's PLP. They must return to brick and mortar after 18 weeks of school and spend at least 50% of their time in school year in the brick and mortar setting. Students participating in the ITM will be required to log in daily to school's PLP and complete work commensurate to the hours required for schools for students in their grade band. Attendance will be tracked using the existence att existing attendance tracking system if students are not actively participating in school's PLP platform during the school day, a guardian will be required to call the school and let the appropriate person know the student is absent. Do we need a uh, motion to accept? I do have one question. I do have one question. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, do you have an idea of how many students are currently using the online program? Sure. And so. We have um, less than 100 students total. Uh, we have less than 10 students that are K-6, which is this model. Um, and then we have um, less than 20 students in 7th and 8th grade. I think the number was right around 15, and the, the rest are high school students. So this only applies to our K-6 students uh, because we do not have an AOI, which is a separate school, mm -hmm. for those students. Okay. And then when it talks about um, they must return to a brick and mortar school after 18 weeks, that they could conceivably if they wanted to stay in the online program, it, but if they did do that, then that would affect our funding. Correct. So the, okay. the way that the legislation is written is that a school can adopt an ITM that gives them full funding um, at 100%, but they have to be in brick and mortar for half of the time. Um, after that, that funding is reduced. Thank you. Anything else? It's a public hearing. So I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. I just want to make sure we're moving on at the right time. Okay. Anybody have any other questions or input? Then I'll move on to two, which is uh, review and accept the agenda for the session. I move that we uh, accept, the, accept the agenda for the session. I'll second. 
Yes. 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 That brings us to item number three, which is Mrs. John. Members of the board, it's recommended that the board review the first presentation of the revised policies listed below per Arizona School Boards Association Policy Services Advisory for July 2021. We do have a variety of policies to present to you this evening, and we will just talk through them all, and we will have the second meeting at the September board meeting. So the first policy is BDF, um, Advisory Committees. Uh, this is just noting that based on... Um, if the board creates an advisory committee or directs that an advisory committee be created or appoints members to an advisory committee, and that advisory committee has the specific purpose of making a recommendation concerning a decision to be made or considered or a course of conduct to be taken or considered by the public body, that committee is considered a subcommittee of the public body and is subject to the conditions of Arizona's open meeting law. So that is just a clarification about committees that you may require to um, serve and bring information to you to make a decision. Aside from the EBT, do we have any other committees that are in existence like that? And not at this time. Moving to the next policy, BEDD, which is Rules of Order. Um, E, a motion to table is in, order, is in order at any time. Such a motion requires a second and is limited to being considered only once on any given agenda item. And no discussion is in order. And G, a uh, new language that the governing board president may recess the meeting without a vote of the governing board in order to maintain the quorum and governing board meeting rules of order. Just to refresh my memory, postponing is a little bit different than tabling in the sense that postponing means you'll probably get to it at the next meeting, but tabling means we're not discussing this further right. indefinitely. Yes. Okay. BEDH is public participation at board meetings. Um, presentations for unsolicited services will not be permitted. Companies or businesses offering services of possible interest to the district should send information to the district office for distribution to appropriate school district officials. This is something that our board already does. It just puts it in policy. EIB is board member development opportunities, and this makes it clear that no public monies can be used for training, orientation, or therapy that presents any form of blame or judgment on the basis of race, ethnicity, or sex. This does not include any training on sexual harassment. Blame or judgment on the basis of race, ethnicity, or sex is defined in the statute by seven concepts. One thing I, I'd like to see in this one, if we could, would be to put the seven concepts in there so that we have, have them. It, they were hard to find. I was able to find them eventually. Uh, and I think they're listed later on in this. In, they're they're in the regulation. Yeah, yeah, they're in the regulation. But we can place yeah, them. Yeah, so they're here so people could see. Mm -hmm. I think they're also later on in this, if I remember as well. This but, statement is later on, but the seven concepts are not, so we can add that as well. Yeah, I think it's very important that uh, people see that that is from Arizona State, uh, you know, the statutes there, and see what they are. I think that will very much help us uh, as we move forward. It will make it very clear. And just for clarification, anyone who has a section here, it is part of their department, so they will share as we get to their department. I don't know if I like the name of the next one. <laughs> what, do, what don't you like about the name? <laughs> you can start there. Oh, a DIE. Yes. All right. So all, that, all that's being added here, <clears throat> you can see that uh, 
It's now a requirement to publicly accept all audits and compliance questionnaires by roll call vote. We've already had that as a standard practice within the district. So we are ahead of what ASBA is telling us that we should do at this point. In policy DJ, <coughs> uh, the addition of the wording for allowance of food and beverages uh, through the governing board uh, is being added. Uh, in talking to legal, though, they have some concerns over that verbiage and, and the wording there. It's very vague as to the language that they are putting into this, this policy. Uh, her uh, main concern, and it always is ours as a district, is the gifts of public funds, having to worry about that. Uh, so the recommendation is to just be mindful that wording is there, but it has been practiced uh, in the district for some time now to do our best to stay away from any type of food or, or beverage that's being offered um, at our trainings and meetings because of uh, gifts of public funds. And like I said, legal is very concerned over the vagueness of how that's worded in this policy. And does this policy only concern what the governing board might provide? So, for instance, if, our, if the five of us said, you know what, the new staff is doing a training, let's chip in and do breakfast for them, it would, this would pertain to that type of instance, but not, you know, an outside group. That, that's exactly the concern, is that okay. I, I asked her, what is, who is the governing board? Is that the governing board, meaning the five individuals? Is the governing board the uh, those who have been delegated authority through the governing board? And all of that is, is very unclear at this moment. Um, bus driver requirements, trainings, responsibilities, policy EEAEA, um, adding that paragraph basically just providing clarification, clarifying language for driver certifications, requirements to, um, and the need to possess a commercial driver's license. Just, just one little thing on this one. Is there, is, is it redundant in the statement right below that that they have to attain the cost of getting their commercial license if they have to present it uh, to, get the, to get the job? Well, there, there are times where that is a question. They will seek questions from the district or, or clarification from the district to see if the district will provide that. Um, I think it's just good to have it just to be clear that they're the ones who are responsible for um, acquiring the license on their own. I also had a question about the wording. So our school district, we directly border, share a border with California but we don't share a border, a state shares a border with New Mexico, but our district does not share a border with New Mexico. Would we only be able to accept California commercial driver's licenses? It just says by another state. So I, I would say um, that New Mexico, uh, any, anyone from north, east, or west. Okay. That actually makes sense because you can drive a car in Arizona regardless of what state you have a driver's license from. Yes. I, was, I guess I'm just tripping up a little bit on the wording how, how it says that the school district has to be adjacent to that state. But I understand now. Thank you. B, professional staff contracts and compensation. Um, we're adding that each fiscal year, the employer will be provided a total compensation statement broken down by category. We are already doing this. Um, it's been in place for a couple of years, so it's just updating the policy to practice. Questions on that one? My company does it for every employee of ours. It's for every employee. All right, GCF, professional staff hiring. 
Um, before employing a certificated or non-certificated person, districts and charter, charter schools shall conduct a search of the prospective employee on the educator information system that is maintained by the Department of Education. We use um, ADE Connect, ADE Common Login, and, and we are doing this as well. Um, and we are actively verifying that we are not employing um, anyone who is a certificated person that's um, had a suspended, surrendered, or revoked certificate without those being reinstated first. And then for our non-certificated people, um, just ensuring that they don't have um, anything in their background that's prohibited by a statute. We are already doing these things again. It's just aligning our practice to policy on this one. And then at MGCH, school districts and charter schools may not require an employee to engage in and shall not use public monies for training, orientation, or therapy that presents any form of blame or judgment on the basis of race, ethnicity, or sex. This does not preclude any training on sexual harassment or lessons on recognizing and reporting abuse. And then this was the one I think we were referring to that whole round, the duplicate. Um, and our, our um, orientation mandatory trainings do not include any of these at this time. So, um, and then it just states the, the penalty for violating this statute. So, uh, again, if we could put the seven uh, concepts there. Um, can you walk me through kind of like the civil penalty, how that would work? Um, you know, this is in there, it's, it's part of state law. Do we have anything from legal on how that kind of works if uh, there is a violation? What occurs is if a staff member is to allege that we have violated this, there would be an investigation. And that investigation, if it is found that we violated it, then they could impose a civil penalty not to exceed $5,000 um, where that violation occurs. Thank you. And policy DDB support staff contracts and compensation. Again, very similar to certified. Um, every fiscal, fiscal year, our um, support staff are provided a total compensation statement broken down by the categories um, of all the benefits or payments that they include. Another practice that's already in place, just aligning everything. Um, and then we took out, you can see the redlined items. Um, we have a salary scale that's presented with the budget, and, and that's no longer being differentiated in this way. And GDF, support staff hiring. Before employing certificated or non-certificated persons, school districts and charter schools shall conduct a search. Um, and then the certificated person, we check um, if, if any of those have been suspended, surrendered, or revoked. Um, we use E-Verify as well, and the IBC fingerprint card process with our support staff. It's the same language as the earlier policy, just updated. on the G policy. Okay. So IC actually refers uh, to the instructional time model that I brought earlier um, and adds the language um, from um, Arizona Revised Statutes that allows for um, an instructional time model that allows the school district to um, make up time um, in the way that they want, um, and uh, states uh, that you're required to have the two meetings in order to do the ITM. IHA um, just uh, cuts out um, the end where the superintendent is directed to emphasize 
the use of resources developed by the uh, SBE related to civics education, um, which uh, is listed in statute. And so the board uh, would adopt uh, what they see fit. Is, is the point of deleting that to sort of take off the burden of a using um, the State Board of Education resources, but we still would want to comply with the second part of that, where it says we want to align with the academic standards of social studies. Like, we'd still want to do the second part of that, but not necessarily the first part. Is that what we're getting rid of it? Yes. So this was actually taken out before when we adopted their policy to begin with. Mm -hmm. What changed tonight was over on the first page, the instructional program will ensure that on or before July 1st, 2022, at least one kindergarten through third grade teacher in each school has received training re relating to dyslexia. Um, it, that requirement had gone into place and it was supposed to be done by July 1st, 2021, but it's now changed to 2022. This yellow piece just shows um, something that was in the original policy, but the board had taken that out the last time this was adopted. And, and the purpose of taking it out is that the consensus of the board is that we didn't need to redirect to emphasize the use of those resources, that teachers could choose the resources they wanted to use. I apologize for missing the blue too. It's very tiny. <laughs> <laughs> what am I looking at? IHAMD is instruction, training, and suicide prevention. Um, as you can recall, we've had to put in suicide training and awareness for grades 6 through 12. They have added the student dissertation card requirement that you do have to have um, information on suicide hotlines or resources for families that may be in need. Um, and that will be in place this school year with our ID. If they say we have to include at least one of them, are we including all of them or just one? It, what's going to be, based on what they have shown through um, our preview, is going to be the phone number or resource that they can have. It's not all. It's just the same. It would be for the different criteria, depending on which resource you're using. Because they'll have a, a name and they'll have a phone number to contact the national or local hotline. IJ defines what a textbook is and defines it as printed instructional materials or digital content, content or both, and related printed and non-printed instructional materials that are written and published primarily for use in school instruction that are required by the State uh, Educational Agency, or LEA, for use for pupils in the classroom, including materials that require the availability of electronic equipment in order to be used as a learning resource. So it defines it broadly and what a textbook might look like um, in the current times. IJJ, which also uh, looks at a textbook supplement supplementary material selection and adoption, it just again redefines that same definition um, of what a textbook is. IMB, teaching about controversial and sensitive issues. Uh, you can see the addition uh, that uh, was passed um, in statute, uh, which we've seen um, a couple of different times in a couple of iterations. Uh, this is uh, about in the classroom, um, and this defines the concepts um, about uh, what's in the classroom does not place any form of blame or judgment on the basis of race, ethnicity, or sex. Um, and this does define what those seven issues are. So in case anybody was watching before, those are the seven, the A through G. So that's where I remember to say. Dr. Stone, UJSAA. Anybody have any additional questions about that one? Um, JFAA is the admission of resident students. Um, so when we're looking at verifiable documentation, um, parents or legal guardians, um, residents, and, and where they may documentation that we can accept. 
a consular identification card that is issued by a foreign government as a valid form of identification if the foreign government uses biometric identity verification techniques, including fingerprint identification and a retina scan, in issuing the consular identification card. That's a so futuristic <laughs> the retina scan. <laughs> seems very much so. So, so where did this come from? This so this is based on um, ARS 41-4001, which was um, recently passed. So then you will find the exact same statement on tuition and admission of non-resident students as something we can accept as um, appropriate documentation. Policy JFD for open enrollment. Um, they added Arizona Revised Statute 15-816.01 and then provided more detail as to the open enrollment and open enrollment process, um, talking about the accessibility of information, site capacity publications, uh, selection of pupils, and the preference uh, on how that would take place. Also, uh, listing of um, may not be limited to admissions uh, based on um, the following there at the end, ethnicity or race, national origin, sex, income level, etc. So just opening up uh, more detail as to the open enrollment process. We see this in talking to legal uh, a lot more when you have districts that are side by side, namely in the Valley area where you have those who are wanting to bring their kids to schools with uh, maybe notable athletic programs and they're trying to get their student from here over into a neighboring district or school for those opportunities. Would this also apply in the district if, let's say, we had a full school and, uh, you know, more students wanted to come there, you would follow this policy down? That is correct. Then you'd have a waiting list. Mm -hmm. Is, is kind of that procedure published anywhere? Are we anywhere close to being full of any of the schools to where we do use it yet? I, we, we have uh, specific grade levels that typically are at capacity, but maybe not necessarily the entire school. Okay, so um, we do use this process. So the, I think the thing that we'll need to really look at a little bit more in depth is the uh, publication side of that, mm -hmm. uh, website, those types of things. Yeah, this, this just comes from ASBA, so. We can certainly ask that question. My um, thought process is it's to be much more inclusive than just gender. Maybe identification. What do you currently identify as? We have transgender students. We have other um, who identify in different ways. And that is inclusive of those personal identifications. We can, we can definitely bring it to our legal and see if there's no, a recommendation. I'm, 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 not trying to, I'm just trying to understand why we would use One thing I'm guessing with that is it's just we're using that same language that comes down from the state. And I think that's something that we can definitely take back and see if that's something that uh, would be uh, allowable. Because I think you always want to stay as close to the state as you can with these things that they have legal problems if I'm correct. Sure. It, and what Dr. Rainey said, we take this directly from the ARS, the revised statute, and that's the language they use, but we can certainly 
We can change this as we wish, and then Terry uploads that to Policy Bridge for ASBA, and they let us know if it then meets the requirements or if, if it doesn't. I'm not suggesting we change it. I was just curious sure. as to why there would be something that's not My guess is that it actually appears in ARS, specifically ARS 13-816.01, because that's the uh, the uh, site and for putting all those uh, identifiers in there. Welcome to state law. notice on page 40, <clears throat> there's just a change between 20 miles, uh, and that's increased to 30 miles for transportation. Should should we be offering transportation to someone who is uh, either a resident or non-resident pupil who is admitted through the open enrollment process? Do we have any students currently that we've left that far? Not that far. Only five miles across town. Again, I'm sure this had to do with somebody in metro in the metro area who. Yeah, yeah that's all. This is all. All of these things are state. Um, policy JK student discipline has brought about some changes with um, disciplining the students in grades K through 4 through invitation to do that. This clarifies under what circumstances we can do long-term suspension or expulsion for students who might be age 7. It does set criteria for us to make sure we are doing what we consider response to intervention, doing some screening before a student who is ending at those grades that meets this criteria has been recommended for a long-term suspension. It also requires, which we currently have in our discipline process, the opportunity for a parent to appeal the decision that is made by a board hearing officer. There are obviously certain circumstances due to the care and safety that have been allowed for those grades that student does bring a dangerous weapon that has created serious problems for disruption. Again, it all has to be documented, and it does have to be trying to respond to certain clear response that is happening. I just want to make sure I understand. So, if a child older than seven years of age comes to school and is found with a gun on campus, um, let's say they actually discharge the weapon that night and they hurt somebody, but it's a one-time thing, because it doesn't fit the criteria of being a pattern of behavior, our school isn't allowed to discipline them? No, it does address the fact that if they do do an incident like bringing a weapon on campus, like a gun, it meets the criteria for that exception to K through 4 suspension. Um, the, what happens very often is, you know, students have a chronic behavior problem, and parents may um, or may not be working with the school to try to address it, getting them identified. This sets a requirement that we do have to do that screen, and then we have to do a certain um, intervention before a principal can come to the hearing officer if that student is at chronic behavior disruption. Um, but if previous to this, it was possible you could have a Kenny Barber come and be recommended for long-term suspension because of their behavior being so disruptive. This prevents that from happening, but that a long-term intervention, again, the student does have to be at least seven years of age before that can even be considered. And there are four ways to immediately do that. If they have a possession of a weapon, if there's use or sale of a dangerous drug, if they're immediately endangering the health or safety of others, or it's determined to 
qualify as aggravating circumstances. So it's the aggravating circumstances that we would really have to show we've documented that we put some things in place, it's not working, um, those targeted interventions aren't, you know, meeting the stated goal. Um, the parents are consulted and notified and part of the, part of the process. I know for me this is probably the area that took me the longest to get my head around and read. Mm -hmm. uh, but after I got it, it seemed like it was a very logical uh, flow, you know, especially in the aggravating situation, you know, where you really do need to document it uh, and, and kind of make sure everybody's on the same team trying to help the students, you know, rather than just, uh, you know, trying to, to wind them and get them out. So I think it's a, I, I really appreciate the detail in this, and I want to see that, you know, I hope, and I'm sure we'll see it out there, uh, you know, on the uh, website for parents mm -hmm. to know that process. The other piece to the discipline is the regulation of off-campus speech and understanding that obviously students do have freedom of speech, but when we have certain situations that do come back onto our campus, this is just um, clarifying that for people to understand when it does become a school issue. And I would say just for the sake of uh, people who are listening in on the meeting and wanting to see it, what are those uh, kind of the uh, situations? Could you We're looking you know? into serious um, and severe bullying that does tend to happen with electronic technology very often. That may start a trigger off campus that is becoming or impacting the student at school. And it's, it's brought to the school's attention what they have to do. You're looking at threatening the teachers or other students. Um, and then again, we're also looking at things like cheating, you know, that things are happening with technology, students using the technology to copy, share um, work that's not their own, or they have to test, or breaking into a computer, trying to hack in. Thank you. student suspension, again, it goes and follows with the policy we just discussed, looking at the criteria of suspension of students that are in grades first through fourth, and understanding that it has to comply with that guidance, and under what certain circumstances a student can be, obviously, brought in either to um, a hearing officer to the board for expulsion. This just goes through the criteria for suspension and, of course, the appeal process as well for them to request to be considered returned to a school setting. to the fun one. JP, she's frozen. <laughs> there are a lot of cages involved, but they're just... <laughs> And JKE is specific to the expulsion. Again, going back and aligning it to that expulsion of people in kindergarten through grades one and understanding the criteria and then the what circumstances. Um, and again, all of these have to apply. Um, and looking at that process, um, the student is seven years of age, and then they're being looking at the circumstances that meet one of the criteria in these, they may be eligible or considered for expulsion. before we move on to JLTB. JLTB is immunizations of students. What is being added is the stipulation to Arizona 15342. A school district or charter school may not require a student or teacher to receive a vaccine for COVID-19 
or to wear a face covering to participate with any person in instruction. Any questions about that? Policy JLF is reporting child abuse and child protection. What they are adding is um, some information that we are required to post and have available where children and members of the community that come into our schools can readily see. Again, it's knowing how to access the information for reporting um, child abuse and then being able to have that information phone number and again how to log on to their website or how to get to their website. And again, it does have to be displayed in the, uh, what they consider a prominent area with children parents can access. So, moving on to KB, which is parental involvement in education. Um, they added that a they must have a procedure by which the district shall obtain signed written consent from a student's parent or guardian before providing sex education to the student. At the same time the public educational institution seeks consent, it shall inform the student's parent or guardian of the parent or guardian's right to review the instructional materials and activities. Um, the district prior to this did use an opt-in um, for those types of lessons. Um, currently we are teaching hygiene at the fifth grade level and this will be something that the district does need to consider during this um, school year as to where we go moving forward. And then also, um, we will have procedures by which parents will be notified in advance of and given the opportunity to opt their children into any instruction, learning materials, or presentations regarding sexuality in courses other than formal sex education curricula. So that is um, a task really for us as a district um, and the city and human department to determine do we have any of these materials or presentations happening, and should we have that? Um, parents would have the right to opt their children in. It's not an automatic that that happens. Policy EG is office services, so we did notice that this was an outdated policy. I'm sure it's in here. Um, but it was the, um, all offices in the district shall be open during the school year. We had from 7 or 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we're changing that from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday, just so it aligns with when we are actually open. Policy DJE, we're <clears throat> aligning with ASBA with changing the purchases of less than $25,000 to reflect ASBA's um, recommendation of $10,000 as a standard throughout the state, uh, but subject to the discretion of the superintendent. So purchases of $10,000 uh, can be made uh, without obtaining written quotes. And then you can see in the next paragraph, it then breaks it down to uh, the written quote threshold of 10000 to $99,999. And then um, competitive sealed bids, um, bidding process, anything $100,000 or more. So this is to align, again, with ASBA. I know in looking back at the history of, of this, um, it has been the practice of the district in some type of uh, communication with the governing board um, many years ago that anything $25,000 or more would obtain governing board approval. But that's not aligned to ASBA policy. Uh, <coughs> governing board approval is for anything $100,000 and more um, as we participate in the competitive CO bid process, um, RFPs that are issued. Uh, or using cooperative purchasing contracts or state contracts for anything $100,000 or more. So the proposal is to align back with the state in following these procurement thresholds uh, moving forward.
So these changes are available for any of our parents or anyone who's watching who would like to review them. They can go to the governing board meetings. This um, packet will be posted if they would like to review any of these policies before the next reading, which is at our September meeting. We can do it again. We can do it again. <laughs> for our September meeting, will we go through them as we just have, or is it going to be part of it? We, we will go through them as a second reading, um, probably with not as much detail, but just some general review and reminders of what the actual policy changes are, and then with the requested changes that were um, asked to be made. Thank you. So the discussion, Mrs. Uh, Ramon asked that perhaps we um, discuss uh, COVID dashboard, we had a parent who emailed and asked um, if our district is going to have a COVID dashboard. Um, my response to the parent at that time was that we do not have a COVID dashboard. Um, we are choosing to not have one. As the board now discusses this, we can certainly have other discussions. We choose not to have one right now as our numbers are very low. And if you put those out on a, on a dashboard, there is the feasibility that you could identify the specific individuals um, from that dashboard. So in, the, in an effort to not violate any HIPAA laws, any FERPA laws, and give out information that, that we should not be giving out, we don't have a COVID dashboard. When we are requested for numbers by the paper, we do give a cumulative number for the entire, from July 1 to whatever date they have asked for. Um, we did look at several um, school districts, and, and they have. There are dashboards out there throughout the state. We can talk about that in a second. Um, I did a little bit of research on that. But I will say in general, um, we've looked at our attendance rates. Um, so attendance rates from the same time. We went back to 2019 when this was um, when we were not in a pandemic situation to this current school year, and at the same time frame, um, it's anywhere from a 1% difference in some schools, um, lower attendance, a 1% lower attendance rate. Um, the highest school has a 4% difference in their attendance rate. No one is below 91% at this time um, in attendance. Some of that we attribute to the fact that we, we have kind of put a campaign out there asking parents that if your children are sick or experiencing any symptoms, please keep them home. Um, we, we believe they are working with us and partnering with us in that effort. Um, so that's part of that reduction that you're seeing right now. Uh, but, but I also don't think that is an alarming rate of students not in attendance at the beginning of the year. Um, in talking to some of our, our nursing staff, they said, Please be mindful of the fact that during the first six to eight weeks of school, we all experience um, getting back in the same room, experiencing the germs of other folks that we haven't spent time with all summer, and that the, a typical opening to the year sees lots of kids going home for a cough, the flu, um, it, it just things of that nature. Um, and in, in that conversation, they really felt that six or eight weeks, we work those kinds of things out and then see where we're at at that point. But there wasn't anything that seemed alarming at that point. Um, so questions from, or concerns from the board? Talk about some of my thoughts. Cause, um, so when I first read the email from the parent, uh, just to give you a little bit of context, she was asking for a dashboard because um, she was um, just kind of trying to figure out whether she wanted to ask her own child to wear a mask at school since they are optional. And that to me seemed like a very reasonable request. Um, thinking about it a little bit more, I feel like because our numbers, the numbers that we would put on a dashboard, are a reflection of parents being willing to to um, have their child voluntarily tested, who is um, who's either been exposed or is displaying symptoms, and then the parent taking the extra step of reporting that positive case, if there is one, to the school nurse. And so because it's reliant on self-reported data, I feel like um, that 
might lead to underreporting. Our dashboard might be, even if it's maintained in, um, in good faith, it might still be underreported. It might be artificially low. And it might give parents a false sense of security. They might look at the cases for school X and say, well, there's only five cases according to this dashboard. I feel like that's a low enough risk that I won't ask my child to wear a mask. The real number might be 25. It might be 50. It might be something that would make the parent uncomfortable if they knew how many cases were at the school. And so I feel like in the interest of giving parents as much accurate information, I want to be transparent, but I also want to make sure that we're only communicating accurate, reliable information, and I'm not sure that a dashboard is the best way to do that. I think notifying parents, as we have been, when, um, when we know that a positive case is in the school and that their child has been in that classroom is the better way, and it gives parents a better sense of the risk. And also just wanted to say, so the health department does collect information from schools, from providers, from all of those places. So they would have the most accurate counts in, the, in our county. Um, they do report those numbers regularly. Weekly, they provide the school district with a, um, a PowerPoint that shows the rate of positive cases um, and, and the number of cases. We do post that on our website. Um, it is under the health department, or I'm sorry, under the health office um, on our website. And all of that information is there and available for folks to see, to use. Um, and I'm in complete agreement with you that that is the place to get the most accurate information. Um, because they do receive all the positive cases from it, all the places that provide testing, as well as the schools. Um, so it is why we encourage parents to go to the health department for that information. Um, another thing that they do break it down by um, age range. So you can see on there per age range the number of cases that they have. Um, again, it may not be that all of the, the kids in that age, age range go to our schools, but you would have a better feel for how many kids in our in our county, and then again, we do break it down by the county system. In addition to what we have posted from the county health department regarding our local data, we do have the county hub right there on our website as well. So again, resources and information are available for parents. And it's important that we're talking about this isn't just a school situation where kids are getting like hands with math and there may be an outbreak in our preschool and sharing that information. This is a community and having that community view is important for parents to really have a better understanding of what is happening in our community to make those informed decisions. Um, when we did look at the variety of websites, we did research, there's about a list of 40 that I was able to, to research and pull up. There's a lot of different information, you know, and sometimes that can be even more confusing because it depends on what's being reported. Some are reporting the numbers that are testing positive that week. Some are reporting confirmed active cases. There is a difference because it take, does take another 10 day on average window where a student or staff member is considered to be positive and active versus looking at just that snapshot of that day. Parents may not report the data in a timely manner and that may or not, may not be in their control based on where they test and when they get the results. That information gets posted so it may not be as accurate because it's being reported on that date and that's what's being confirmed. So again, looking at information does change. Um, and we are trying to be as open as we can and communicating with our parents and sending those monitoring notices. We are sending more of them <laughs> because again, we're trying to let parents know um, COVID is still very active in our community. And when there is a case, they need to be making good informed decisions we need our parents to continue to work with us and keep their students home if they are sick or are displaying those symptoms so that we can try to control that and keep our schools open mm -hmm. and healthy. And there was a conversation about masks. Um, while they are not required, they are certainly welcome. They are in all of our nurses' offices. They are in all of our buses. I had to be at the high school the other day, and students walking by the nurses' office and said, hey, do you still have masks? And he received a mask, and moved on and it, there, 
what I'm seeing is I'm very proud of our school community, very proud of our students. I don't see, you hear a lot in the news of people being bullied in one way or another. Um, I don't see that as our, at our schools when I'm walking around and watching kids and you have kids who, who are choosing to wear a mask and kids who are not, and that is not an issue. They are all perfectly fine with each other as they're walking through the hallways, going to class, in the lunchroom. It, I'm just very proud of them for that. Um, it is a testament to our community and, and how our kids work together and how our community works together as a well. whole. Yeah, I, I want to kind of go off some things that uh, uh, Ms. Ramon said. Is, um, I think it's very hard to get some type of dashboard that would have any type of accurate information on it. Uh, that said, this is, might be something to think about if we would have some type of general health uh, dashboard. I'm not thinking that it's something that we should do anytime soon, but a general health where it's real basic information. How many kids are out of school? Like you're 91%. That way we're not talking, we're not making judgments whether it's COVID or, um, you know, the flu or whatever. But, you know, you can kind of see, oh, there's a lot of kids out in the school. So I don't know that that's something that I, I want to kind of press for or anything like that, but there may be some value in that type of dashboard where we're talking about generalities and not just, um, you know, looking just at COVID. I would agree with that. I've got uh, two kids that have been out of school the past two days that went to emergent care and they were cleared to go back in. It is, none of it's COVID related. One of the kids was diagnosed with strep. So it's just stuff that happens with kids. Mm -hmm. If we make a COVID uh, case page, I think we're asking for people to keep kids home. And I think that I'm more comfortable with my kids going to school than I ever have them. I hope your kids feel better soon. Um, and then, since we're on the topic, I do want to make one more plug for um, our school nurses. Um, that is a really good resource as well if you have questions that are specific to your circumstances. Um, I've had nothing but positive experiences with all my kids' school nurses. So it's true, you know, discussing with them, I was treated with compassion and understanding and confidentiality and all the things that you would expect from a medical professional. And we are really thankful to have one in every school. Can we also talk about the insurance policy while we're on the topic? Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> I did talk to speak to our legal counsel, and we do have uh, coverage as we did last year uh, that continued on into this fiscal year. Uh, the rate um, across across the state with the trust, it's a, it's a pooled shared group with districts across the state. Our annual premium is $22,500, which is way below the $75,000 that we had to pay last year. Um, in speaking to legal, uh, they make the recommendation that it is good practice to continue with the renewal. Um, and they believe that the coverage is adequate. Um, there are definitely some deductible tiers that are part of any type of occurrence that may that may happen uh, on the insurance side, the liability side, um, but that that is where we stand at present. Do we have to do any of the things that we did last year with the waivers or anything, or is that done by the wayside? So depending on, <clears throat> on the deductible that the district wants to receive, then uh, if we did send out the waiver, it would allow us to have, based on how many respond, um, and they don't have a set number to that. They just want to see that the district, in good faith, sent the, the waivers out and, and had a good amount returned. That would give us a zero deductible. Uh, sending out the acknowledgement form would be a $10,000 deductible, and doing nothing would be $20,000 deductible per, per occurrence. 
and legal's recommendation was to to rely on the local body to make that decision. So right now we are at the $20,000 deductible because we've not sent those out to students or parents at this time. Shall we please receive two? If, if the board is finished with discussion or questions or concerns. Okay, then we're on to updates and announcements. Um, we've got a future meeting coming up on Tuesday, September 21st at 6 o'clock right here. If you didn't get enough bus, you can come back. <laughs> Any other announcements? Updates? Hearing that, I'll move on to uh, number five, which is adjournment. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Yes. 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 We're adjourned.